Well, today what we're doing is we're beginning a brand new series uh, that I've just been praying about for a long time. Um, and we're just calling it Winning the Battle Within. And um, I could just give you a whole bunch of statistics, but you really don't need it in that we know that many of us deal with issues such as mental illnesses and, and anxiety and depression. And, and living in this culture is just hard. And many times we just don't know what uh, to do with it. And so over the next four weeks, what we're doing is we're just going to take a journey together um, of how we can win this battle. How do we win the battle uh, within? So I'm going to ask you to stick with me all four weeks because they're just going to all build uh, on one another. And we're here at the church. We're a real people looking for real answers to real life issues. And so I just got to tell you, if you're struggling in those areas or if you have a loved one that's struggling in those areas, I just want to tell you, you're welcome here. This is a real place. This is a safe place where you can be you, okay? Warts and all, okay? Um, none of us are perfect. None of us have life all together. And those who uh, say that and act like they do are lying, okay? And so this, I want you to know this is a safe place to be. And so we're so glad that you're here. Uh, before I just dive in this topic, I think we just need a little bit of framework to this, to this topic. And so here's the first thing. I just, I just really need to get this out of the way. And it's kind of a heavy way to start, but it's just really important. And that's this, is that if you're feeling suicidal, you need to get help now. Like, I'm glad that you're here and this is a great place to be, but you need to get more help now. And so what we've done is in your worship guide, we've put a phone number that's in there, the National Suicide Hotline, that you, you have available to you. It's out there on the screen. And uh, if you're suffering in this area, I want you to have that handy. And if you need it, I'm begging you to call it, okay? You are not alone in this journey. So if you're at that point, I just, I just beg you, call that number and, 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 and get help, okay? Here's the second thing, it's just kind of the framework of our journey. It's this, is that not all, you know this, not all mental illness is the same, okay? So this is not a cookie-cutter message series because many of us have issues or difficulties from different ways. Some of us, maybe we've just got pain. Maybe we have PTSD. Maybe God has, something has happened in our life and we're struggling with it with God and like, why has this happened to me? And, and, and this, is, this is one thing that many of us are suffering. Others are suffering from anxiety and that anxiety or depression comes from different ways of life. And so I just need you to know that this is not going to be a cookie cutter uh, message series. So everything that we talk about is not going to be like smack dab right in the middle of where you're at. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a broad look of what it means to be okay in my soul. Like, what does it mean to have healing and health in the innermost part of who we are? Are you with me, church? So that's what we're going to look at. Here's another thing and we just need to, just to pay attention to is that mental illness is progressive. And what I mean by that is if we don't make changes, it just gets worse. Because many times we just think, oh, I can, just t I can handle this. I can do this on my own, um, and it's just going to be okay. Can I just tell you, just like if you were to get cancer or any other illness, if you don't do anything about it, it just spreads. And I just want to encourage you, as we walk through this journey together, do something now. Don't wait. Because the longer we wait, I'm just going to be honest with you, in dealing with this issue over the last 20 years, in, in ministry, the longer it goes and we don't do anything about it, the longer it takes to get back. Are you with me, church? So I'm going to ask you, to let's, let's, let's deal with this now. And then here's the last one, and it's important. This is maybe the most important one of all as we take our journey together, is that your spirit, your mind, your emotions, and your body are all connected. Like, you're just not, like, this is my physical part of me, my spiritual part of me, my emotional part of me, my mental part of me, and it's all separate. No, God did not design you that way. Like, you're, it's all connected. Anybody ever get nervous about speaking in front of people? Anybody? Actually, believe it or not, I do get nervous, even though I do this every single week. Actually, I was nervous today. And so what happens, like, if you're really nervous about something? and you're having to do something like that, what do you do? You spend the morning in the bathroom. I'm not giving you no TMI here stuff. But you, your body is connected 
to everything. And so, so goes your body, so goes your emotions and your mind. So goes your mind, so goes your emotions, and your body will fall right behind it. And so what we're going to look at is we're going to take a comprehensive look at this whole issue. Now, I'm going to tell you, um, we're going to, in, in, these, in this message series, we're going to take a look more so at the spiritual, the mind, and the emotions. And then I want to encourage you with this. Uh, I'm going to ask you to follow our Facebook page. And what we're going to do is we're gonna actually going to look at the body, and we're going to do some videos over the course of the month of how, what we can do with our body to help battle this issue of of depression, anxiety, mental illness, and how, how all that correlates. So, so you with me, church? So that's what we're going to do. And so in our message series over the next four weeks, what we're going to do is we're just going to look at four simple, if you want to call it, actions or concepts that are progressive. If we'll do, I believe it will help you take next steps in this uh, this issue of, of mental illness. Are you ready, church? You with me? I need hair. Are you with me? Are you awake? Are you with me? All right. So, so really what, I'm just going to go straight at it today. Really what I want to talk to you today is about just getting honest. I just want to talk to you today about getting honest. And there's a theme verse that I have for us today. It comes out of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And it says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, for those of us who struggle with anxiety and depression and things like that, he, the Apostle Paul starts us out with something that we just really, to be honest, we don't like to hear, and it's just really, just to be honest, it frustrates us, because I've been there, got the t-shirt. And when he says, don't be anxious about anything, like Paul's saying, stop it. And you're like, I'm trying. You, you, you with me there? Like, we're trying. But here, he, he presents something to us that's, that's very simple, and it's profound. And it's this. But in every situation, what's in every situation? Everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Like, be honest about it. Let's talk about it. Don't hold it in. And for many of us, we go at it alone. Like, I don't want to admit that something is wrong. When in the reality is, there's many times there's things that are broken on the inside. And so Paul, so Paul's like, instead of being anxious about it, let's make a different choice, which is hard. But what we want to do is we want to be honest about it. Now, about seven years ago, um, I saw the signs, but I didn't pay attention to it. But one night, about midnight, um, I woke up with it, like my heart like just beating out of my chest. I never felt that way in my life. And it was like, oh man, what is going on here? Am I having a heart attack? And I could just remember the whole room felt like it was just closing in on me. And I remember waking up my wife and just, I don't know what's going on and, and what, what's happening to me. And so we're just on the phone talking to, to physicians and nurses at our church and like, what is going on? And, and so we went to the doctor the next day and I was, I was having a panic attack. And that event propelled me into two years of depression. Life was hard. I got to tell you, I can remember the days, like, I could not get through a work day. Like, I'd go to work, and after an hour and a half, it felt like, again, just the world was collapsing on me. And I had to get out. And so I would leave and come back. And I was blessed that the, my job was helping me through this journey. I remember, like, I it forgot what it meant to have fun. I mean, I just couldn't. And, like, even when I went to places, I felt like I couldn't stay there. Like, I, I, I couldn't be there. So I remember one evening going to my wife, and I was like, you need to get out of the house. You, you can't, the, your depression's getting the best of you, and you, you got to get out. So I remember going to Cabela's and just walking in the store, and I just felt like, I can't do this. And I really curled up in a ball. I just, I can't do this. I remember going to a, to a staff retreat and, and going there, and really I was just there for an hour, and I just had to call my wife and say, come and get me. I remember not wanting to be around people. I remember that 
it was, can I just be honest with you? It was like the reason why I was like I was was everyone else's fault. You've been there? And it's hard. Like I couldn't function. And so God took me over a two-year journey. And in that two years, God began to unravel things in my life and to show me things that were broken. How I was handling life, how I was coping with life, the stories I was telling myself that just weren't true, the physical things that were happening in my body because of it. And what I want to do today is... And throughout this series, I just want to share, share with you some things that I've learned that God has shown me about how to deal with this. And one of the things that I had to do was I needed to get honest about it. Because here I am, I'm a pastor. Like, I'm not supposed to deal with this. You all saw in the news this week, we lost a great pastor this week who committed suicide this week because of what was coming and going on on the inside in a weak moment. And we need to get honest about what's happening on the inside. And so to do that, I just really want to pick this apart just for a little bit. Honest about what? Like, I'm just not okay? Yes. But there's, I want us to probe a little bit further of what's not okay. I want you to take out your worship guide. I want you to look at these things. Look at these things. And here's the first thing, really, we just need to be honest about. And it's, and it's this. It's my pace of life. We need to get honest about our pace of life. That for many of us, man, we just go and go and go and go and go. I brought myself a little illustration here. Um, Don't judge me, but I really don't drink coffee. Um, So with that, uh, Dr. Pepper's my sin of choice. Um, But uh, we call it Texas tea, okay? Um, (laughs) Okay. But here's what happens. If you could imagine your emotional well-being and your emotions kind of filled up here in this coffee pot. And what happens is, is I go through a tough time. You're poured out. I'm going 90 miles an hour. More is being poured out. I'm stressed out about my work. More is out. And it just keeps draining out. And here's what happens. As this goes lower and lower and lower, we get sicker on the inside. And eventually I start getting stressed out. I can't handle life. And then all of a sudden we have a panic attack because it's just getting lower and lower and lower because of our pace. That there's, I gotta have more. And here's what happens. When, 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 we get, when life gets crazy, what, what goes out of our schedule? Things to take care of us. And so what, what needs is there needs to be a fill. There needs to be fill. And here's what we do. We just go and go and go and go and go. And then we decide, I'm just going to go on vacation. I'm going to go into the beach. And that's going to change everything. But you know just as well as I do, that doesn't work. That what ends up happening is we've learned is that this is a slow fill. You can't fill it up with the beach. Just, what? okay, I'm better again. It doesn't work that way. That it's a slow fill. And for many of us, we go and go and go. And when we do, we fail to take part of our inner man, of our inner self. Everyone else is a priority except taking care of our own soul. The Bible says this in Ecclesiastes 4, 6. It says, better one handful with tranquility then two handfuls with what? What does it say? Toil and chasing after the wind. Like our schedule and everything that we do to try to please people and to make everybody happy, it tears us on the inside. In fact, Jesus said this. He says, what does it profit to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Remember hearing that verse before? We think that when he's talking about lose his own soul, we think about heaven and earth or heaven and hell. and things. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about what does it profit if we just go and go and go, but we lose this, our inner person, that we're no longer okay. Like what benefit is that? Because when our pace is out of control, 
we fail to take care of our inner person. And for some of us, we just really need to be honest about that today. Here's another thing we need to be honest about, is our need to control. Now I'm going to step on some toes here just a little bit. See, you're a soul that's made by God, made for God, and made to need God, which means you're not made to be self-sufficient. I need you to hear that. When we sing that song, Jesus, I need you, that is true. And many of us, were hurting on the inside. And so to make ourselves okay, we have to control our circumstances. It's hard for us to trust God. God, I, I, I have to take care of this. See, we, we have to control life because what is going on on the inside? Like, I have to control my relationships, okay? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. I got to control what's happening at home. And the reality is, is that I trust myself more than trust God. See, we live our lives with the attitude, if I don't, it what? Won't. It won't. And can I just tell you that this control thing, it's just a facade. You don't really control much. You don't. And see, the more that you try, the crazier life gets, and then we die on the inside. And what happens is because of our pace of life, we try to control all the moving parts and all the relationships and the person who, who doesn't like us and maybe the relationship with their spouse and we try to fix everything, we try to control everything and then life gets crazier and then I just die on the inside. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, he says, therefore don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself because we're fearful of what's gonna happen. Like if I don't, it won't. Each day has enough trouble of its own. We know that. That's why Jesus wants us to trust him. In Psalm 56.3, it says, When I'm afraid, I put my trust in who? You. For many of us, when I'm afraid, I'm going to trust myself. And I've got to control everything. Now, why is that? I'm going to look, here's the next one we need to be honest about. And it's this, my insecurities. We need to be honest about our insecurities. Many of us, we're, we're insecure about our appearance, the way that we look. It's not just your teenagers, it's you too. We're insecure about that. We're insecure about our finances, our family life. And so what does that cause us to do? Am I going to be okay or not? And because I don't feel like I'm going to be okay, we have to control life. We do things that we normally wouldn't do. And can I just tell you, it damages the inside. Uh, you, I've told you this before. You're looking at one of the most insecure people that you'll meet. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, and that's what helped led me to what happened to me. <laughs> I remember when I was like seven or eight years old, my dad was the, a music pastor at the time. And so we were all singing and everything. And I wasn't. I was a little kid, like seven years old, and I was working a book. And then the pastor comes up. My dad just got through leading a song. And in front of about a crowd this big, he gets up there and says, Hey, Greg, you know your son wasn't singing during that song? Like the pastor in front of everybody. And I remember that moment just, I want to curl up in a ball. And at that point, it felt like my, my performance mattered. Like I wasn't okay unless I acted right. And it affected me all throughout my life. That my performance, because of my own insecurities, dictated how I felt about me. In fact, one time, <laughs> that's where it really, I, when my, before I did this, I was a worship pastor. And I sang, and I could sing. And so the reason why I did that is because people liked the way I sing, and it made me feel good about me. I just, let's just be honest. And when I did great, I felt good. And when I didn't, I remember one time when I was early on in my ministry, you know, back then we did songs like, celebrate Jesus, celebrate, da 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 you know, just little fun stuff. And, and I would do vocal ad libs. And one time I was doing this ad lib and I was like all over the place. And it sounded terrible. I was so embarrassed. And so after the church's little kid, he's probably six or seven years old, he comes up to me and says, hey, Pastor Matt, you know what? When you did that in the church service, it like sounded like you had ants in your pants. <laughs> but he said, don't worry, it happens to me all the time. 
And you think, why did you remember that? Because of what it did to me, to my insecurity. It fed into my insecurity. That many of us were insecure individuals. And when we get insecure, it affects our minds, our emotions, and our behavior. Many of us, when we feel secure, here's what we try to do. We try to control things. We try to control situations. Our fears begin to swell. What are they going to think? So we manipulate. We control. We use anger to get what we want to control people. And I'm going to talk to the men here for just a second. Okay? I've met a lot of angry men. And can I just tell you, it's because of insecurities in your heart. And what ends up happening is we feel insecure in our homes and we take it out on our families. And I just got to tell you, that is inappropriate and it needs to stop. Because here's what happens. You use your anger to control your home because of what's going on on the inside of your heart. Because I feel insecure, I've got to control my environment, all of my, all, all, everything that's going on in my world. And can I just tell you that, that the people who are most angry are the ones who are most insecure. And it's the truth. For some, of you, for some of us, winning the battle within means I just got to get real and honest about my insecurities, about how I feel about me and what's going on on the inside. And when we do, man, it just sends us down the road to healing. Many of us were crippled by what people think of us what people have said. And here's the thing, that the Bible tells us that we are wonderfully made, that he loves us, that you matter. And when we trust him and we put our identity in him versus what has happened in our life, that it puts confidence in our soul. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, verse 17, or chapter 17, it says this. It says that those who put their confidence in him, that trust him, that their worth is in him, it says that they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. Now watch this. It does not fear when heat comes. So like for many of us, when our insecurity, when things happen in our world, it gets us unsettled because of what's going on. And the heat does affect us. But it says here, it says its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never foils, fails to bear fruit. So some of us, we just need to get honest about our insecurities. Here's another one. We need to get honest about our pain. Like how you deal with your pain will determine your future. And some of us have gone through deep pain. Actually, I looked this past week and like, 6.6 million people in our country are dealing with some form of PTSD. And man, I'm sorry all that happened to you. And it's for various reasons. We've been hurt by people, but we've got a lot of military people in our church. And man, that's just, we, we can't comprehend what has happened. But can I just tell you, how you handle your pain will determine your future. And some of you are right there right now. And for many of us, what we do is we decide to bury it. I don't want anybody to know. But here's the thing. Can I just tell you, it doesn't stay buried. All that stuff doesn't stay buried. It comes out. You may think you're hiding it, but you ain't doing a good job of it. Everyone else around you knows. We just got to get honest about it. Look what uh, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, pain uh, removes the veil. It plants the flag of truth within the fortress of a rebel soul. Like pain removes, <laughs> it removes everything and you can see what's underneath. And I would add this ongoing pain. Pain shows us that something is broken inside. And for many of us, we avoid it. And it's time we get honest about it. I love what the psalmist said here in Psalm 34. He says, the Lord is close to the bro brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. We just need to turn to him and be honest. And then here's the last one we need to be honest about, and that is, this, is our mistakes. We need to be honest about our mistakes. 
Like many of us live in shame because of things that we've done. And what happens is what we do, we cover it up. We mess up, we hide from it, we make excuses for it, we lie to cover it up. We tell us a story that's really not our fault, right? But it never goes away. It stays with us. And we actually, we put up this facade that we just can't keep up with. Uh, the perfect example of this was Adam and Eve. Remember the Garden of Eden when they sinned? What did they do? They hid behind some bushes. They put some clothes on to protect themselves. To, or, they felt like to protect themselves, to, to cover up that which is hurting from their mistakes. God doesn't want us to live that way. That's why he sent Jesus, to pay for our mistakes. That when we receive Jesus Christ, our Lord, we have power in our life to help remove that shame because he loves you just the way that you are, no matter what you've done. The Bible says in Romans 8, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That there doesn't have to be condemnation anymore. That we don't have to be ashamed of the things from our past. That we don't have to put on a facade and cover up and, and hide and do all those things. Maybe it's we cover it up because of our ego. I, just, I don't want anybody to know. We're as sick as our secrets. Can I just tell you that, church? says this in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And, and we forget about this part here at the end and purify us from all unrighteousness. Like, what would it be like if all that was wiped, slate was clean? That you didn't have to live with that anymore. To do that, we gotta get honest about it. So there's five things, there's probably more. But things we need to be honest about. Now, over the course of our journey, over the next four weeks, we're going to look at two individuals who struggled with anxiety and even depression. And there were two kings. One was named Saul, and one that came after him was David. And they experienced some of the same things that we experience. King Saul, he suffered from depression anxiety and depression. We see it throughout his story. Now, they don't have modern medicine back then to diagnose it. And all. We can just see it through scripture. We can just see it. And one thing that we see from King Saul's story is that he was never honest about his insecurity as a person. He was even actually called on the carpet for it, and he didn't get real about it. See, in the book of 1 Samuel, we find Israel looking for a king. Like every country had a king except for Israel. But the thing is, God wanted to be their king, but the people were like, I want a king. I want a physical king. And so God's like, okay, I'll give you one. And he chose King Saul. Now the Bible says that King Saul was a physical specimen. Like in scripture it says, there was none like him. He was tall, handsome, awesome, strong, <clears throat> all of that, okay? But yet he was insecure. In fact, the day that he was going to be announced that he was king, uh, they, they had this all journey and process to, hey, here's your king. And when they, they announced his name and who he was, he wasn't there. He was hiding in some luggage because he was just insecure. He was insecure about who he was. He struggled with what we would call self-esteem. We find that is in his insecurity, what happened in scripture, he had great anxiety. He was always worried about what people thought about him. In fact, uh, there's a story where God gave him instructions actually to destroy some ungodly people and everything, every last person, every last thing. But Saul didn't honor that request. Why? Because he was afraid of his people. Because his soldiers, his people, they wanted the spoils of everything. And so he didn't destroy everything. And so what happened was is that there was a prophet named Samuel to call him on the carpet of it, uh, on it. You didn't obey God. And it says this in 1 Samuel 15, 24. It says, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. And watch this. I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. He was on the, called him on the carpet, Samuel did. And Saul even admitted it. 
But here's the thing, he really didn't get real about it. Samuel went on to tell him, you know what, because of this, God doesn't really want you to be king anymore. Like, I'm gonna, he's going to take this away from you. And here's the interesting thing about Saul. He was so worried about what the people thought of him that he didn't really, you would think to say, you know, Samuel, I'm so sorry. God, forgive me. I'm going to do better. Teach me how to do this. <laughs> but watch, we see in the next chapter, look what he says to, to uh, Saul. He says, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Like, I know that he's taken the kingship from me, but would you just come to me and just like, let's pretend that like me and God are good and you just stand up for me in front of the people so that way I still look good in front of people? You see the story here? It's about the facade and he's not getting real about it. He's like, I really care about how everyone sees me. And the thing is, when we're insecure, it changes our behavior. And over the course of the rest of his life, we find him continuing this charade. And it casts into a whole bunch of depression and all kinds of erratic behavior that we're going to look at in the next few weeks. He was always anxious and low. He became irrational and violent. And you see, the reason why, I believe, is because he just didn't deal with it and get honest about it. I'm broken. Fast forward, King David. We look at King David like, here's the man after God's own heart. Like, he could do nothing wrong. Actually, King David was the same way, except his actions towards it were different. He, he had the same stresses that King Saul did about, about the kingship. And what happened was, was David made a big mistake. Scripture says that one spring when he was supposed to be off at war, he was on a roof watching a woman bathe. And what was significant about it, all the kings during the spring were supposed to go off into war. And can you just imagine, David, and you just fill in the blanks here. Man, I'm just tired of this. This is all stressing me out. This is hard. And, and when life gets hard, what do we do? Escape, right? We got to find a way to escape. Many of us, because of our depression, our anxiety of life, we escape. We go to pornography. Maybe we go shop. Maybe we could do all kinds of, to escape from everything. And that's what David did. He escaped. Like, most of the men were gone at war. And so here's a woman bathing, thinking there's nobody around. And we think, oh, it just David just happened just to notice her. Please. He was looking for a way to escape. And he did in the arms of another woman, another man's wife. Here's the problem. She became pregnant. And now all of a sudden, I'm the king. I'm the godly king. And I'm supposed to have this facade of I'm a good guy. So he's thinking all the story in his head, and I've got to make things right. And so what does he do? He brings home the guys, the husband from war and saying, hey, sleep with your wife so it makes it look like that it's not my kid and all that stuff are okay. And it wasn't okay. And in fact, he kind of keep covering it up. And eventually he's just like, man, I just got to kill him. And so he had the man killed and took him as his wife. He was struggling on the inside. But here's the difference. There was just as Sam, God sent Samuel to Saul, God sent a man named Nathan to David and called him on the carpet and said, you know what? This is what's going on. But here's the difference with David. David got real with his stuff. And we see this beautiful picture of it in one of the most famous psalms. He wrote this psalm, and it's in Psalm 51. And I just want to take it just a couple minutes real quick to really look at what did David do to find peace. One person didn't. King Saul didn't. But David did. And I want you to look at this, this psalm. And here's what happened with David. Here's the first thing, is that he became humble. He humbled himself. He says this in the first verse here. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Like, I'm getting real with you, God. I recognize you're God. I'm not. I messed up. There's things going on in my life I can't control. I'm just coming humbly before you. And some of us, our pride is getting in the way of getting real and finding healing. 
Like, we need to come to God and other people and say, I'm not okay. I can't do this. I need help. Here's another one. We need to be honest with where we're at. David says this in the next verse. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He's saying, all I can see is what I've done wrong. I know I'm just trying to manipulate, control different things. But every day, all I can see is what I did and what's going on. I, I, I can't escape it. And many of us, we're in the same place. We just need to be honest about where we're at. Actually, verse 6 of this, it talks about that God desires truth in the innermost place of our life. And we just need to be honest with where we're at and what's going on on the inside. Here's the next one. And we just need to ask for help. We need to ask for help. David says, cleanse me with hyssop, he's talking to God, and I will be clean. Wash me when I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness and let the bones that you have crushed crushed rejoice. Like, I need joy again. I need you to take this from me. I can't do this anymore. He says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Church, you need to ask help from God and other people. Life isn't a do-it-yourself project. Talk to someone. And here's the last thing that David did. And this may be the most challenging, is we gotta be willing to change. David says this, restore to me the joy of your salvation. I want this back. I want to be how I was. But it says, grant me a what? A willing spirit to sustain me. Can I just tell you, it's easier. When we're depressed and low, we want everyone else to change. And like, if we're even approached to change, it's like, you don't understand what I'm going through, so leave me alone. And the only reason I can say that is because I was there and I did that. But we have to be willing to change. David's like, I don't want to stay here. I want the joy of my salvation. You know, when we're depressed, it's easier just to stay where we're at sometimes. It says later on, Psalm 51, 17, it says this, my sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Like when I humble myself and ask for help, and even when I'm willing to change, because change is hard. Don't get me wrong, change is hard. But when I do that, when I'm willing, and when I come to God with that way, it says he, can't, he won't despise us. Like he comes to me, he comes near me, he helps me, and it's the beginning of the journey. It's the beginning. And 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. He loves you. And can I just tell you, we love you too. And today, let today be the first day, a new day for you in your journey with this. And it begins by you getting real being honest. So we're going to help you with that today. And we're going to end our service today a little bit different. Inside your worship guide is a blank piece of paper. Should be. And many of you thought, oh, this is something's wrong with this. <laughs> there should be something on it. No, actually, you're going to put it on there. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you, as I've been speaking today, the whole, I know the Holy Spirit's been moving in this place. I'm going to ask you to write down what you need to be honest about right now. Why? Because he cares for you and it's the beginning of your healing to be honest. And here's the thing about our God. He is powerful and he can bring healing to your life. And I want you to write that. I don't pay attention to what everyone else is writing. I just want to write I want you to write it down and I want you to fold it up. Okay? I want you to do that right. I want every person to do it. Come on. Come on. Here's the thing. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 20, 19, verse 26, it says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. 
You think, how can I get help from this? How can I get help from my husband? How can I get help from my wife, my parents, or myself? And how do I find healing in this? And how do I move forward? You know, with man, it's impossible. But with God, everything's possible. Do you believe that, church? Jeremiah 32 says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm that nothing is too hard for you. Nothing's too hard for him to bring healing into your life. So here's how we're gonna end our service today. Uh, I'm gonna, some of us, we need to take the first step in making Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna pray for us. And then what I'm gonna do I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to be honest with the Lord. I'm going to take, I want you to take it to Jesus. And here, I'm going to actually ask you to physically do it. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you, we're going to sing a song together. We're going to stand. And I'm going to come and ask you to take that slip of paper. And I'm going to ask you to put it in those baskets as a symbolic gesture. Lord, I'm going to get real about this in my life. I'm going to get real. I'm going to ask you, some of you need to get in a small group. You need to tell someone. You need to tell someone that you love, that you're struggling. I'm going to ask you to, to get real. So here's what I'm asking you. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to ask our ushers to hold off for just a minute. Go ahead and stand with me. Um, we're going to pray together. And I'm going to ask our ushers to hold off. We'll do our offering in just a second. But what I'm going to ask us to do is I want every head bowed, every eye closed. And if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I just want to ask you to pray this simple prayer. There's power in your corner now when you make Jesus the Lord of your life. Only two people can run your life, you or him. The question is, who's leading it and how's it working? So if you're ready to give your life to Jesus in the quietness of this moment, just pray a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I need you. And Lord, I need help. And so Lord, I need your power in my life. Lord, I want you in my life. Be my Lord and my King. I recognize what you did on the cross for me. So Lord Jesus, save me. By your power, save me. I receive that in my life. Be my Lord. Be my King. I pray for those who pray this prayer. And now, church, we're going to sing this song together. And I'm going to ask you as we sing together, in this gesture, I'm going to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to put it before the feet of the Savior. Just real quick, just come put it up. Put it in there as we sing back your seat and then I'm going to pray for us. Let's sing this together.